Dr. Martin Brokenleg, a member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. I first met Dr. Brokenleg band, holding back his flowing black braid from his eyes as we high-stepped, low-stepped, and side-stepped in our aerobics class at the back of the room. This and his clear joy in dancing to Flashdance and Billie Jean and connecting to students outside the regular classroom kept me in awe of him as a leading professor at my alma mater when I was a young 18-year-old beginning college. Then I took courses with Dr. Brokenleg, a psychologist, a counselor, an Anglican priest. He taught me stories of coyote, of bison, of bear, of eagle how to wrap and burn the sage for blessing and smudging. The histories of Lakota peoples whose cultural and religious practices had been violently harmed by his own beloved Episcopalian church. The healing of Uwipi ceremony. I honor Dr. Brokenleg and welcome you to this place. Welcome to this special time between Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer and the University of Oregon during her virtual campus residency. I'm here to introduce you and welcome you to this space and the event and to provide thanks and land acknowledgement. Uh, others will be blessing the space and um, providing introduction to Dr. Kimmerer. So welcome to this place that logistically offers you bathrooms down the hall through the art gallery, invites you to please take your special UO limited edition copy of Braiding Sweetgrass and assigned book place by doc, book plate by Dr. Kimmerer that you'll find out in the lobby, as well as a to-go snack on your way out of this space. I do need to note that if you have picked up a snack already, uh, we need to eat in designated places in the building and the ballroom is not one of those. I welcome everyone across our mixed modes of gathering. We had approximately 200 RSVP for this space, the ballroom in the EMU, and uh, over 800 people are RSVP'd for the live stream feed. So welcome to you all. A special shout out to our co-sponsors and partners in the Bend area, Central Oregon Community College's Season of Nonviolence, and Christy Heinrichs, Robin's agent at Authors Unbound. We are so pleased to be engaging with you across the region and the state in this way. And to those of you in Sweden, Belgium, and other places from around the world and far-flung regions of the United States, welcome. Welcome to this place, Kalapuya Ilahi, the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people, our territorial hosts. We express our respect for the Kalapuya people and for all federally recognized tribal nations of Oregon, the Burns Paiute tribe, the Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayusla Indians, the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon, the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians of Oregon, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, the Coquil Indian Tribe, the Cow Creek Band of Umpqua Tribe of Indians, and the Klamath Tribes. We also express our respect for all other displaced indigenous peoples under other bands and tribes who call Oregon home. Dianya, excuse me, Dianya Hippie, welcome. I am Julie Volker Morris, director of the US Common Reading Program housed in the Division of Undergraduate Education and Student Success. UO Common Reading is a campus-wide program that builds community, enriches curriculum, and enhances research through reading, discussion, and programming of a shared selection, shared story, and shared experiences each year. Our 2022 theme is focused on anti-racism, cultural inclusion, and equity-minded action. I cannot truly share how thrilled UO Common Reading is to host Robin Wall Kimmerer, the author of Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants. When the advisory committee announced Braiding Sweetgrass as this year's selection, we were overwhelmed with the love this book has already on our campus. Over 50 faculty members are applying this beautiful book in their courses to thousands of students. Staff groups are gathering to read and discuss the book in relationship to their work as colleagues, for our students, and the renewing of the world. An extensive and interactive teaching guide associated with Braiding Sweetgrass was lovingly crafted by graduate students, faculty, and staff for uses in classes and other discussions. This guide built on prior work by UO's Native Studies faculty when we read Louise Erdrich's The Roundhouse as part of UO Common Reading five years ago. During the current winter term, pop-up events are being hosted to distribute copies of Braiding Sweetgrass throughout campus. 
These pop-ups have been very popular and included open houses, discussion groups, scavenger hunts, plant ink craft kits, and a basket weaving demonstration by Brenda Brainerd of the Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua and Site Usla, and retired School District 4J Tribal Programs Director. Thank you to groups who have partnered with us, including our campus museums, UO Libraries and the Craft Center, the Tutoring and Academic Engagement Center's Hub and First Year Programs, Mills International Center, the Dance Department, Composition and the Writing, Public Speaking and Critical Reasoning Minor, Journalism and Communications Johnson Lecture and the Just Futures Initiative, the Office of Sustainability and the Office of the Vice President for Finance and Administration. More events are to come and I hope to see you there. Welcome also to this place with difficult histories that need addressing. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland, this place where we now sit, by the United States government and forcibly removed to the coast reservation in Western Oregon. These and related acts of violence affect the way the state and the university operate today. UO Common Reading is joining address of these histories in small part through our unceded kinship land, place, people project facilitated by UO alum Amber Starks, who is Afro-descendant and a member of the Muscogee Creek Nation. Welcome to this place where we are imagining, dreaming, and inventing new ways forward. Descendants of the Kalapuya people are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians of Oregon, who are making important contributions in their communities, at the UO, and across Oregon each and every day. The UO specifically is a pillar of indigenous knowledge and expertise woven throughout our endeavors by faculty, staff, and students in women and gender studies, education, <clears throat> law, English, indigenous race and ethnic studies, linguistics, languages, sociology, anthropology, theater, journalism, first year interest groups, environmental studies, political science, philosophy, history, and so many other disciplines. Multiple books, articles, conference proceedings, and theater, music, and other performances are produced by our faculty and graduate students each year, contributing to a significant body of shared resources and published knowledge. Native American and Indigenous Studies students have produced special maps, walking tours, and stories of the Indigenous and Native peoples connected to the U of O. Faculty have engaged in distinguished policy work, such as leading the guided passage and implementation of Senate Bill 13, also known as Tribal History, Shared History, that directs the Oregon Department of Education to develop K through 12 Native American curriculum for inclusion in Oregon public schools and provide professional development to educators. In addition, the UO boldly acclaims that a focus on the environment is who we are, that the intellectual research and teaching mission of the institution includes specific contributions to a just and livable future focused on paradigm shifts and problem solving associated with climate change, governing powers, the built environment, and fundamental relationships among people, most especially the amplification of voices that have gone unheard, such as those augmented by the UO's Tribal Climate Change Project and through the Provost Environment Initiative. Welcome to this place and the peoples in it who are leading, as Dr. Wal Kimmerer teaches us, as joy-filled and heart-centered, as well as intellect-led scientists, writers, thinkers, philosophers, creators, performers, educators, pond churners, plant tenders and plant researchers, managers, mathematicians, botanists, and so many more. Kimmerer calls us to reclaim wisdom known and felt in our bones, our hearts, our minds, our guts, as we move about the day, when we enter forests or hike our favorite local butte as a field study, work in our garden patch or tend our indoor garden, build relationships with our children or students, and sit at our desks to write. Welcome to this special time with Dr. Wall Kimmerer in conversation with the University of Oregon. Dayan Yahipi. Welcome, Robin. I now turn to Angela Noah of the White Mountain Apache Tribe and current Miss Indigenous UO for a blessing of this space. Thank you. Angela Noah. Hello, my name is Angela Noah. I am the 2020-2022 University of Oregon's Miss Indigenous. And it is an honor to be here in the Zoom chat with um, Indigenous authors 
And I'm so excited to engage in conversation around this book. Thank you for this opportunity. So I'm going to lead a prayer. Um, we always like to open in a good way and just take this moment to be present, uh, maintaining connections and um, learning, growing our minds is, is a good thing. So we wanna make sure that everyone feels um, safe, that there's protection um, and, and yeah, that, that we're just coming together in this time to, to, be, to be together. So I'm going to share a language, um, a prayer that's been taught to me in Apache language from um, back home. Um, and so <clears throat> um, you're welcome to turn your camera off if you want to be in private or, uh, but please come back on after. And I'm going to say the, this language and then we'll move on to more of um, an intro and welcome our um, guest of honor. So uh, with that, let me go into prayer um, and just um, be in a moment of gratitude of just mindfulness. Um, just, you know, we're just taking this time and I'll be doing this prayer, but um, yeah, this is just from my people's language. and. You know, I just want this moment to be a time of, of reflection and, and just mindfulness. So with that, here we go. No hui ta ya kat yu dasen da hi niji du zil go be go zilet. Nant an an li hi be go ro wa. Hak o te go an di yu ya kat yu be na go wa hi ke go. Negotsan be cut you alto, bear godol del. Digi dahi da do lel, no hua agonsi. A he and choco, no huchi adats a he biga. Ba nagorant a he, gecko, no hui alto and choco. Adats a he biga, no hua, naragoran in a. Nano with ad and tie you debt. Anna who we would del hila aina and choco. At air he but argent. Hano with dill, the harget the wapa, nant ah, la e, nino with the e tissue at air he. La e zis go and air he, the harget bears the ze, the lel, the lel go a te, gojodele. And I just want to share at the end of what I said on that prayer, gojodele means let everything be good. So let this time together that we are um, be good. We welcome you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and with that, I will pass it on to our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Angela. And at this time, um, Robin, we want to present to some gifts that we're going to be sending you. Um, and uh, so I have some students here who are going to help me with that. Um, we, um, as you see here first, is our um, brand new home flight blanket, which is a product of a partnership between the University of Oregon Alumni Association, the Deck Store, and the Many Nations Longhouse. And uh, they are designed by Sherrod Yonker, an award-winning native artist, and his daughter, Kalea, an art major in her senior year here at the U of O. And together, the father-daughter artist team came up with the blanket featuring traditional uh, coquille geometric basketry patterns that mimic nature, in this case, ducks flying in a V pattern, as you uh, hopefully can receive, see. And the blankets are available for purchase um, by anyone <laughs> through the deck store. Um, I don't intend to make a plug except for the fact for you to know that any D um, blanket you purchase goes directly back to students and or other native programming. As uh, Dr. Yonker, the, the chief of Coquille Nation and our uh, assistant vice president for sovereignty and government relations noted, buying a blanket says, I am supporting native scholarship on campus. Um, and in addition, we have the UO um, printed uh, edition of Braiding Sweetgrass for you that features quotes by um, students, faculty, and staff, um, rather than, you know, New York Times or Wall Street Journal or something. And, <laughs> um, and then um, another book by a local author that is an almanac of plants in the region. And um, finally, just a very simple um, common reading uh, t-shirt to thank you for being part of our programming. Um, and there are other gifts that are coming. I don't know if Brenda Brainerd is on our Zoom. Um, is Brenda on? Can IS tell me? Um, 
anyway, um, Brenda, who I mentioned before, is our basket maker. Um, she uh, has also made some jewelry for you, um, and we will be sending that. Mm -hmm. And some classes are um, also creating gifts um, to um, thank you for your wonderful campus residency with us this oh. week. And so look for those in the mail. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm touched and honored. Uh, now I want to introduce one more person before we turn to Robin, and that is um, Rochelle Nieto, who is from Klamath Falls, Oregon, and is Modoc and Yahushkin Paiute of the Klamath Tribes and Chicana. She's a third year doctoral student at the University of Oregon in the Critical and Sociocultural oh. Studies in Education program. Prior to that, she spent nine years teaching and instructional coaching at the Warm Springs Reservation at Warm Springs K-8 Academy. Her research is focused on indigenous pedagogy, praxis and curriculum, ethnic studies, and historical healing. So uh, we will turn it to Rochelle, and then uh, we'll turn it to Robin for your remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sapkecha. Um, how are you? My name is Rochelle Weezer Nieto. Um, I'm a member of the Klamath Tribes. I'm Modoc, Yuhuskin Paiu, and also Chicana. Um, before I get started, I just wanted to take a minute to ground into this space. This is a practice that's been modeled for me by um, two of my advisors and mentors, Dr. Michelle Jacob and Dr. Leilani Sibzelian. They are my advisors, and um, they always start meetings in such a good way and classes in such a good way. So. Just want to give you a chance to sit tall in your seat if you're sitting, um, if you're standing, sit nice and tall, feel your spine, and then take a couple really deep breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth and through your nose and out through your mouth. I just love starting in that good way. I'm also going to light a little bit of sweet grass because that's the reason why we're here. So I wish you could all smell it. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, like the introduction said, um, I'm a third year student in the Critical and Sociocultural Studies and Education program. Um, I'm a third year, so this is my last year of coursework, and then I get to start my research next year. And I'm hoping to work with teachers, native teachers in Oregon, who are implementing this tribal history, shared history, Senate Bill 13 curriculum, and um, bring them together for sharing circles in a Zoom setting so they can share with each other how it's going, teaching the curriculum, and supporting each other and sharing resources. Um, so I'm really excited to do that work. Um, I'm just really excited to be here with you all. So thank you so much for being here. Um, what a gift it is to honor the work of Dr. Robin Wall Kimmer. Um, gosh, this book is such good medicine to me. I hope it is to everyone else too. Um, I feel like everybody that I talk to resonates with a different chapter or a different section for a different reason. And um, one of my favorite things to do with the book is just to flip it open at random. So I literally will just like take it, flip it open to wherever, and then I just read those pages and I feel like it's creator's message to me for that day. So whenever I'm feeling stressed or um, just needing connection, I have a few books that I like to do that with. And um, Braiding Sweetgrass is definitely one of them. Um, as a doctoral student who is going to be responsible to my own research ethnics, ethics and writing a dissertation, I am just so grateful for the gifts and the teachings of this book. I'm particularly drawn to the chapter Mishkos Kinomagwin, the teachings of the grass. And if you want to turn there, if you have your book with you, it's on page 156. And um, Dr. Kimmerer starts the book out, or that chapter is set up in a dissertation format. So there's the introduction, there's the lit review, there's the hypothesis, all the way to the conclusion um, and findings. And I just love the way that that chapter 
can guide uh, students such as myself on the ways that we can um, stay true to ourself within a system that wasn't built for us. Um, higher education and education in general and my research as an undergrad and working in the Warm Springs KA Academy, I've done a lot of work around um, the history of native education all the way from oral tradition, the way that we traditionally taught each other and continue to teach each other to these days by sharing stories and, um, and what the impacts of the boarding school has done to our people and the very real and insidious ways that the boarding schools sought to eliminate us as a people. And now existing within those systems as a teacher and also a student, this chapter really made it um, so approachable in the way that we can navigate those spaces where we can um, be ourselves and also do the research that we want to do while jumping through the hoops of the university and our committees. Um, I'm really lucky that my committee is gonna be amazing and I won't have to do that, but I know that's not true for a lot of people. So um, I just wanted to give thanks for that. Another um, takeaway from this chapter is um, the teachings of honoring our relations. In this chapter, Dr. Cameron describes re um, really honoring our more than human relatives and particularly the grass. Um, and for me, you know, that would be all of the medicines that are local to my own tribe, especially desert, sage, and cedar. Um, the importance of listening true listening to our elders and letting them guide our work because they have the knowledge and our peers and relation, relating to our peers. And even in those times where we don't agree that we can find ways to still work together and um, support our students. And then finally, I love the mentorship between Robin and her student in that book. And um, Another student was supposed to be here doing the introduction with me. We wanted to do it in a relational way and she wasn't able to be here. She's in seminar, which I think they're listening. So, hey, everybody, sorry, I'm not there. Thank you for excusing me. Um, our Sapsaquatla seminar, Sapsaquatla is a teaching program, a native teaching program in the College of Education in UO Teach. And we provide grant funds to put um, native students through school to get their master's degrees and earn their teaching license. Um, and then their payback responsibility is to go out into native communities and teach. And um, I am a lucky alumni of that program. So that's how I got my master's degree. And I have returned back to the university to get my PhD. And I work for Sepsiquithla as a GE. So it's just really beautiful the way that the universe brings things full circle. And um, one, of the, one of the current UO Teach students and Sapsaquatla students right now, Savannah Martin, was going to join me in doing this introduction. Like I said, she couldn't be here, but I really wanted to honor the fact that um, she and I have been peers for such a very long time. And um, now I'm her supervisor in earning her um, master's degree, which is really amazing. So I met Savannah back in the day when she was like a middle schooler, um, high schooler at the Many Nations Longhouse when I was doing my undergraduate work. And I got to do, um, I got to teach a summer program, um, UMISTA, and we taught middle school and high school students. And Savannah was one of my students way back then. And again, full circle now, she is in Sapsaquatla and I'm her supervisor. So I'm just super lucky to be working with her again. And I really wanted to just uplift Savannah. So Savannah is an enrolled member of the Confederated Tribes of Siletz. Her teaching placement is ninth and 10th grade biology at North Eugene High School. And she is currently independently teaching anatomy and physiology to mostly 11th graders. Savannah is a force. She is a beautiful warrior and I'm so lucky to call her my sister. To close my introduction and then turn it over to Dr. Kimmerer, um, I really wanted to share a poem that Savannah has written. And um, it's just a really beautiful 
piece, so I'm going to read it out loud. This is by Savannah. I visit my mother when I return home to make sure she doesn't forget me. I drive out to the coast, park my car in the lot, and take off my shoes. I stumble through the dunes with short labored toddler steps, cutting my naked feet sideways into the hills. My toes stretched out, grasping the sand with the same desperate worried clasp of a mother's flesh shared by little monkeys at the zoo. Each visit is overcast. With the fear that I will be stolen again, with the fear that she won't remember me or that she will be mad at me for leaving, but the ocean and I both know that we were stolen from each other. Tentatively, I inch up to where she sighs into the earth, calming my anxious barnacled heart. I step into her again. Her chilly arms embrace my toes and ankles. She remembers me. She is not angry. We cry into each other, and I promise to always come back every time I am stolen. If I were sentenced to death for blasphemy, for storytelling, the truths of indigenous science, like Socrates, or like Socrates was for his own impiety, instead of hemlock, I would gladly walk back into the body of my mother and take the ocean into my lungs again. Respirate, amniotic, fluid, and go home. So I just really wanted to share that poem by her. I feel like it fits in so beautifully with the style and the way that Robin writes. And um, Robin, we're just so honored to have you here, Dr. Kammerer. Thank you so much, Musip Ketcha, Musip Ketcha. Thank you. Miigwech for those beautiful words, for taking us to the edge of our mother ocean. That was so beautiful. Thank you. You've begun us in a really good way. I want to begin by saying in our beautiful language, Bojo in Denwe Magunadok, hello, all my relatives. Shabadaske Gish Kokwe Nadeshnakas, Budwe Wad Mikwenda, Megaze do dem Minwa, Mako do dem. My name in our beautiful Potawatomi language is Light Shining Through Sky Woman. I am a member of the Bear Clan and also of the Eagles. Shishibanyak Nabendigwes. I am enrolled in the Citizen Potawatomi Nation of Shawnee, Oklahoma. And Miigwech Kinnikeko. Great gratitude for, for all of our gifts and for the privilege of being in one another's company this afternoon. I wish it was in person. I love the Willamette Valley. I love the Mackenzie. I love your campus. I've been there on many occasions. And, and so I simply want to say that, you know, I, while we have to be separated for the circumstances that we all understand, um, I, I feel a great kinship to you all and, and to your homelands. I want to share my screen here since you're all sitting inside. Let's look, um, invite in our more than human relatives, especially the beautiful Camus that you see here um, on, uh, from, uh, not from the Willamette Valley, actually. Um, I also want to, as we always do in our Potawatomi ways, to begin with gratitude of gratitude miigwech to one another as people for the privilege of being together for this beautiful day that we are whole and healthy and surrounded with a companionship of oaks and grass and geese in the sky. Gratitude for the Onondaga people in whose homelands I reside and to whom we owe an unpaid debt of history and um, land um, and knowledge and of course for the gifts of the earth with which we are all showered every single day. And much of the society that we live in speaks of these everyday gifts, these miracles as natural resources, as if they were our property, just waiting for us to transform them. In the ecological sciences, we sometimes call them ecosystem services, but to traditional people, 
to me simply as a human person um, with my basket full of berries and hopefully uh, a tummy full of pie, they feel like gifts from the other species who surround us. Although we live in a world made of all of these gifts, all of us, most all of us, find ourselves harnessed to institutions and certainly to an economy that is relentlessly asking, well, what more can we take from the earth? When I think the question that really we need to be addressing together and that we'll spend our time on together today is what does the earth ask of, of us? I want to frame this in terms of one of the oldest conservation sustainability policies on the planet, Nagan Gebejek Mkwan, that you see here represented in an ancient treaty belt between my Anishinaabe people and our Haudenosaunee neighbors. It is known as the Dish with One Spoon Treaty Belt. And in this belt, what it says is that we people who live near one another will regard the land around us, our mother earth, as a dish, as a bowl, as a big basket full of berries, if you will. And that we agree that we will share the gifts that are in that bowl. And that we will keep that bowl clean. And that we recognize that when that bowl is empty, it's empty. It's our job as people to keep it full. The dish with one spoon treaty agreement also speaks of the spoon, the way in which we take from Mother Earth, from the bowl that she has provided for us. There is Bejik Mkwan, one spoon, one spoon for all of us, not a big one for some people and nothing for others. This is an agreement with the land and with one another for justice. I couldn't begin my talk without also inviting Ian Wingosh, my teacher, the sweet grass, who you see here in these beautiful green, gleaming braids. You'll remember from the book that sweet grass is understood as the hair of Mother Earth. And that's why we braid it, for the same reason that we braid each other's hair, um, as a sign of love and care for one another's beauty and, and well-being. There are those three strands in a, in a braid of sweet grass that for me represent indigenous knowledge or traditional knowledge, a strand of knowledge from Western science, but both of those are ways of knowing um, that belong to human people. The third strand is the knowledge of the plants themselves, of the medicines themselves. And together, we use the healing gifts of sweetgrass, the healing gifts of those of all of that knowledge to ensure the well being of Mother Earth and that the bowl remains full. The relationship between those three strands of knowledge that you see in sweetgrass have not always been easy ones for me. I was lucky enough to grow up in the woods and the fields. I grew up on the land, understanding all these beings to be my relatives, my friends, my, my companions, my teachers. And so there was really no question when I went away to college that I would study botany. Um, the plants tapped me on the shoulder from a very young age and we walked together ever since. And so I knew that I was going to have a interview on my first day at university. And so I was ready. I needed to be ready because I knew I would be the only native student in the entire campus and one of only a few women in a forestry school. So I polished my answer so that when my botany professor said, Miss Wall, why is it that you want to study botany? I was ready. I said, I want to know why goldenrod and asters look so beautiful together as you see them here. These two plants grow in the same sorts of habitat, but they could grow on opposite sides of the meadow, but they don't. They grow together and create this splendid um, aesthetic explosion of color. I said, I want to know why the world is so beautiful. And he did this, you know, that Miss Wall, 
that is not science. That is not botany. He said, scientists don't concern themselves with beauty. If you wanted to study beauty, you should have gone to art school. Whoa, what a surprise for me. So I tried again. I said, well, I also want to know why the plants make medicine for us and why some plants bend for baskets and others don't. And he said, also not science. But tell you what, you take my botany class and then you'll learn what plants are all about. I had no vocabulary of resistance. I, I had no way to know what had just happened in my life. You know, I thought I had made a mistake and that maybe he was right. He was, after all, the botany professor and I a beginning student. And that's why I look so happy on my first day at the university. This was a setting in which I felt, from which I felt deeply alienated, as if my way of knowing was not welcome there, that my way of being was not welcome there. In a way, my first day of higher education was an echo of my grandfather's first day of education at the Carlisle Indian School, one of the infamous, perhaps the most infamous of the in Indian boarding schools. He was taken there as a little boy of only nine years old, taken away from his parents in Oklahoma, where he was forbidden to speak his language, think his own thoughts. I bet he knew why goldenrod and asters were so beautiful together. I would like to tell you that ed education is, is very different from that, and it is. But in, there is also, as you've heard from previous speakers, the notion that education can be a homogenizing force, a forces of assimilation. And it is our work to undo that. In walking from an indigenous growing up into the university, into Western science, I inadvertently stepped out of my way of knowing of thinking about nature as subject, that all the trees and the grasses and the ferns were persons. I had walked instead into the Western worldview of objectification of, of nature, where the ecosystem is understood metaphorically, not as a community, but as a machine, a collection of interacting parts that human beings um, can, can tinker with. I had walked into a worldview whose emblem might look like this. And it seems to me that for the past couple of centuries, which let's remember is only an eye blink of time in the lifetime of our species, that we've been doing an unintended experiment with very tangible results. We've unwittingly asked, what if we believed in this pyramid this pyramid we know as human exceptionalism? What if a single species, and in this pyramid, only some of that single species are more deserving of the richness of the earth than, than any other. And not only that, in our possession and our dominance of the living world, somehow the ecological laws that constrain growth and consumption don't apply to us. It's as if the laws of thermodynamics have been re repealed on our behalf. This experiment in human exceptionalism also tests the hypothesis of what would happen if we believed that the earth was nothing more than stuff, a strictly materialist utilitarian natural resources view of earth, and moreover, that all of that stuff belonged to us. And we know that the results of this experiment, this thought experiment, worldview experiment are in and the results are that we are teetering at the edge of the precipice of climate catastrophe, entering what evolutionary biologists are calling the age of the sixth extinction. What does the earth ask of us? The earth asks us to change. And yet so much of our environmental discourse is all about changing technologies. It's all about changing light bulbs, policies, laws, and don't get me wrong, all of those things, tax structures, all of those things need to be changed. But as a scientist, 
I don't think it's more technology that we need. I don't think it's more data that we need. I don't even think it's more money that we need. If we are to survive, and if our more than human relatives are to survive as well, we need to change more than light bulbs. We need a change in worldview from this notion of land primarily as a source of natural resources. Within the Western paradigm, what does land mean? Yes, natural resources, land as capital, land as a source of e ecosystem services, and land as property. Property for which we can claim rights, individual rights to pieces of terrain. This is what land means through that Western lens, the lens that I walked into when I started my education. But what if the earth asks us to change to different meanings of what land is through the indigenous lens that views land as the source of our identity, that we are literally inseparable from the, the land, that the land is our sustainer, the land is full of those who take care of us, who make our land possible. Because the land is the home, not only for us, for our own species, but for all of our more than human relatives as well. Land as the connection to our ancestors and to our descendants, for we will become ancestors. Land as the library, as the teacher, as the source of our knowledge. Land as the pharmacy, the healer for ills, both physical and spiritual, because the land is inspirited, because the land is our home. We see land not as property for which we claim rights, but land as the place where we enact our moral responsibility to the forces which enable life on the land because the land is sacred. What if we could change our lens on what land means? Would we be in the same place that we are in this moment? I think we are living in this era of profound error because for most of humans time on the planet, before this great delusion of human exceptionalism, we lived in cultures that embraced the values that you see here, that understand ourselves not as masters of the universe, but as the younger brothers of creation. The scientific worldview that has dominated our landscape like a monoculture for the last 500 years has of course created tremendous gains in knowledge and the quality of human life without question. But we have also paid the price for this set of values. It's not more knowledge that we need right now. I think it's more wisdom. And generating wisdom is simply not within the purview of science alone. We need a science that draws upon mind, body, emotion, and spirit, knowledge that draws upon subject and object. We need Indigenous knowledge. We need traditional ecological knowledge, which is based on this model of who we are in relationship to all the other beings on the planet. Recognition that we're not atop some fictional pyramid of life, but we are a member of a democracy of species governed not by individuality, but by laws of interdependence. I want to tell you a story about this. This time that you and I are living in right now of great change and great choices, has been spoken of by our ancestors in the teachings which we call the prophecies of the people of the seventh fire. It's a long story, an important one, a beautiful one, and I can share only a tiny fragment of it with us uh, today. Each of these fires, these seven fires, refer to periods in the history of our Anishinaabe people as we moved across the land and as we moved through time from our ancient origins on the mouth of the St. Lawrence River among our Anishinaabe, or sorry, our Wabanaki relatives to our present um, distribution in our homelands today. Each of these fires represents where we were and the conditions of our time. 
It is said that at the beginning, before those white sails came in the east, prophets arose among our people who said big changes are coming to Turtle Island. And to safeguard the sacred fire, you need to move to the west, to the place where the food grows on the water. In each of the fires, as our people undertook this migration, there were prophets who foretold the losses that would come to us, the loss of our lands, that we would be separated from our sacred homelands, that we would begin to lose our language, that the black robes would come among us and try to disrupt our sacred spiritual lives. All of this we know has, has come to pass. But the moment I want to speak of is this one that after all of the losses of land and language of sacred ways and of each other, it's said that people will come to a time when you can no longer dip a cup into the river and drink, when the air will become too thick for us to breathe, and when our plant and animal relatives will begin to turn their faces away from us. And it is said that that is the time of the seventh fire. And in the time of the seventh fire, all the world's people, the Anishinaabe, the original peoples, and Zaganash, the newcomers, will stand at a fork in the road together. And in my imagination, one of those paths from the fork is green and soft and all dewy. You could walk barefoot there. And one of the paths is black and burnt. It's made of cinders that would cut your feet. And the prophecies tell us that all of the world's people have to make a choice between this path of materialism and greed that will destroy the earth and all her beings or the path of care and compassion, of bamadaziwin, of the good and balanced life. And we know what we want, but the wisdom of this teaching is it says, no, you can't just go down that green path. You have to turn around. You have to walk backwards along that ancestor path and pick up what had been scattered by history, what had been lost along the way, to pick what had been taken along the way, the stories, the ancestors' teachings, the songs, each other, are more than human relatives and our language. And only when we have found all of these and placed them in our bundles, those things that will heal us, can we walk together along that green path? And these are the questions that you and I face at this particular moment in history. What will we find as we walk back along all of our ancestors' paths that will heal us and bring us back to balance. It's a time in which we have to ask, what do we love too much to lose that we will pick it up and carry it through the narrows of climate change safely to the other side? Because there is another side. The prophecy teaches us that the people of the seventh fire will need great courage great creativity and strength and wisdom, but that they will lead us to the lighting of the eighth fire of peace and balance. And do you know what? It said that you and I are those people of the seventh fire. To make that transformation, we have to pick up along the ancestor's path are these teachings. In this time of great peril and choice that calls us all to courage and to commitment, I don't know about you. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot this slide, the lighting of the eighth fire. In order to light that eighth fire of ongoing balance, reciprocity and harmony with the living world, we need guidance. And in this time, I long for a teacher. I wish I had a wise grandma who could guide us about what to pick up and how to find that path. And it's said that when Grandmother Moon looks over us, 
she left our teachers behind for us. And the ones that she left for us to teach us are the plants, our oldest teachers. In many indigenous traditions all over the world, we think about plants, not only as persons, but as our oldest teachers. They've been on earth far longer than we have, and they embody the, vir the virtues that we honor of creativity and generosity and strength and endurance. Who better to look for, look to for guidance than those who can make food out of light and air and water, and then they give it away, just as they do the medicines that they distribute for free. We might do well to look to them for guidance. And whenever I'm wrestling with any question in my life, I often turn to the plants for counsel to see what they have to say about it. And what if you were that teacher, a keeper of great knowledge, but had no voice to speak it or a pen to write it, but there was something that you needed to say. And plants tell their stories, not by what they say, but by what they do. And the name for plants in my language, in Anishinaabemowin, reminds us of this. All of the plants collectively are known as mishkikin, which means the medicines. They're all healers. They're all teachers. And when we take that word mishkikin apart, and, and etymologically, what that word actually means is the strength of the earth. That plants represent the strength of the earth. And in this year, which is the warmest ever recorded, when glaciers are melting, storms are rising, and hundreds of our fellow beings are in grave danger, it's important that we have our teachers. We don't have to innovate our way out of this dilemma alone. In the Indigenous paradigm, we recognize that knowledge comes from multiple sources by listening to intelligences other than our own, to the wisdom and the knowledge of the land. And this is grounded in the understanding of the personhood of all beings and the intelligence of nature. And of course, forward thinking scientists have a parallel so-called new area of study based on accessing this intelligence of nature for design, for engineering, for environmental problem solving. You know this discipline as biomimicry, the notion that we could learn from the living world, how nature has evolved solutions to life. Predictably, this so-called new science of biomimicry grounded in indigenous knowledge is so far restricted largely to learning what new products we might make to be bought and sold. But what interests me is how what they might teach us about how we could live. Because plants know what to do about climate change. They don't dither in endless ineffectual meetings and debate carbon tax structures. They just get to work. They could be a model for the transformation that we need. I mean, after think about it, they have already converted to a 100% solar economy. Now, some of you have probably heard that Richard Branson has established the Virgin Earth Challenge to spur design of technologies that would remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it while we are transforming to a fossil fuel free economy. It's a lofty goal, really critical deployment of, of human creativity on behalf of the climate. And the prize is a whopping $25 million. And certainly human ingenuity will be part of the solution. But I think we have to keep in mind that there already is a system that pulls carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and it stores it for centuries. It has even more bells and whistles. It generates oxygen at the same time. It builds soil, it protects biodiversity, it purifies water, and it makes us feel happy and peaceful, and it's called a forest. I say, give that prize to the trees.
plants don't put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, they take it out and they sequester it, right? In long-term storage in the bodies of tree trunks, in 12 foot deep roots of prairie grasses, in deep bogs of peat, in the organic matter of rich fertile soils. After all, what are coal and oil, but the carbon of prehistoric plants? They kept it out of the atmosphere until we decided to rip open the earth and burn it all up in tons of stored fossil carbon in just a few centuries. Plants have been sequestering carbon all this time. They teach us to keep it in the ground. What do plants do when the climate changes? They grow faster when there's more CO2 in the so-called CO2 fertilization effect, but hard as they might try, as the plants grow full tilt, they run out of other things like nutrients and water and soil, which are in ever shorter supply. But plants don't degrade the soil, they build it. Plants don't degrade the water, they purify it. And when we stand in a shower of rain that you Oregonians know so well, we have the plants to thank for that. Cut down enough forest and the rain disappears, just as it is happening in the deforested Amazon today. Plants save the water. And as the world heats up, who is it that creates oases of shade? Who cools our urban heat islands? But the trees doing sophisticated air conditioning without using a single watt of electricity. They don't ruin the land, they heal it. They are our teachers of restoration. We could do worse than engage the traditional philosophy of learning from the plants. And as we engage in the myriad solutions that are going to be required to um, address climate mitigation and adaptation, we have to remember the nature-based solutions and invest more fully in nature's inherent capacity for climate regulation by all the mechanisms that you see listed here. But the sad truth is that Carbon budget models tell us that we are likely way past the point when we could rely entirely on forests and grasslands to reestablish carbon dioxide balance, even if we could protect and invigorate every last acre. We've simply added too much carbon to the atmosphere, cut down too many forests. We have crippled the ability of the plant world to respond, which is why the plants can't do it alone. They need us. They need us as activists, as practitioners, to work from the local to the global to enact system change, not climate change. If we take seriously the indigenous notion that the plants are our teachers of how we might live, the question for all of us as students must then become, if the plants are our teachers, how could we be better students? And for one way, you know, like our teachers, all of our teachers tell us, how could we be better students? We could pay attention. Ethnobotanists tell us that our great grandparents knew hundreds of plants by name and by use. Our ancestors knew even more. Of course they did because they lived in a time when people understood that food and materials come from the earth and not from a store or a factory. But today, did you know that the average American suffers tremendously from what has been called plant blindness? Average American can recognize a hundred different corporate logos and only 10 plants. Is it therefore any wonder that we live in a society that recognizes legal personhood for corporations and no legal standing at all for birch trees or for blue jays? Knowing the beings with whom we share the world is also a pathway to recognition of the world as gift. The world seems so much less like a shopping bag full of commodities or natural resources and more like a gift when you know the names of the ones who are giving you aspirin for your headache. Her name's Willow and she lives up by the pond. She's a neighbor to Maple who gives you the syrup for your pancakes on a Sunday morning.
what does the earth ask of us? I'm sorry, I, did I just move the wrong slide? Oh no, I'm good, sorry. Um, what does the earth ask of us? Respect. And naming is one way that we show respect. It can be a really powerful tool for transformation from that pyramid worldview to the kinship worldview. Because recognition, recognition of personhood for all beings opens the door to ecological justice. The laws that we have today, our environmental laws, are all about governing our rights to the land. Um, but the shift that we, that we need is to include the rights, not to the land, but the rights of the land, the right to be whole and healthy, and the simple right to exist. If we engage our indigenous teachings, which regard all living beings as persons, we can follow the lead of our Maori brothers and sisters who have worked to have their sacred river declared a legal person or to the indigenous led nations of Ecuador and Bolivia who have enshrined the, right, enshrined the rights of nature in their constitutions. To the global movement, again, led by indigenous philosophy, manifest in the universal declaration of the rights of mother nature that is currently before the United Nations, where I had the privilege of speaking a few years ago in support of the rights of nature for, for Mother Earth. Recognition of personhood takes place not just in international courts, but in our everyday speech. And I want you to think about this for a second. Most of us in this room speak English. Our native languages in many cases set aside through assimilation and in many cases through linguistic imperialism. In the time of the seventh fire, it's beautiful to see the way that our languages are being revitalized. And to my mind, one of the many losses associated, oops, sorry, with, um, with this linguistic imperialism and the loss of language is this word right here. Let's think about this for a second as English speakers. In English grammar, you and I refer to members of our family and our fellow humans with the grammar of personhood, don't we? We say he or she. We would never say of our beloved grandmother, oh, well, look, it is making soup, right? In saying, referring to a human as an it, we would have stolen their personhood. We would have disrespected them. And yet, how do we speak of our beloved grandmother, Earth? We refer to her as it. Objectifying nature opens the doors to exploitative economies because language codes for our relationships with the world, delineating the boundaries of our circle of respect and, equal and compassion. And when we refer to a maple tree as an it, it's a whole lot easier to pick up a chainsaw than when we refer to a maple as a her, when we might have to think twice. And in our beautiful Potawatomi language and in many other indigenous languages, do you know what? It's impossible to speak of the living world as it. We can't say it about birds or berries or the camas that you see here. Our language doesn't divide the world into him or her, but into animate and inanimate. And the grammar of animacy is applied to all that lives. Sturgeon and mayflies and blueberries and boulders and rivers. We refer to other members of the living world with the same language that we use for our family because it is our family. If we are to survive here, if our plant and animal relatives are to survive here, one of the things that we need to pick up to walk that green path is the grammar of animacy. Reclaim our respectful relationship with the earth. So I have a modest proposal for you to, today to consider how might we animate the English language and outlaw the saying, the objectification 
of nature. We don't need language that objectifies and exploits nature. We need something very different. And in thinking about this as a scientist who has to write my papers referring to my beloved plant teachers as it, um, I, I'm committed to thinking about how do we undo this linguistic imperialism and help shift our worldview away from pyramid to circle. In Potawatomi language, the word for an earth being, maybe a human, maybe a maple, maybe a beaver, maybe an eagle, is Bamadisi Aki. And I have no illusions that Bamadisi Aki is going to slide into English. But the last little part of that word, Aki, which means the earth, what about Ki? Could we adopt Ki as a new pronoun, an animate pronoun for an earth being? so that we might speak of these maple trees and not say, I'm going to go drill it, but key is giving us the gift of, of, of sap this spring. And of course, we're going to need a plural form as well. And one of the ways that we pluralize in Anishinaabe Mon is to add an N, but we already have that word in the English language, don't we? The plural of ki can be kin, so that when we see those geese flying south, we can then say to our relatives, you know, have a good trip. Our kin are flying south for the winter. Come back soon. Uh, we will miss you. I've tried this experiment with my students. And of course, they say it's a little hard changing your pronouns. Um, and they stumble a little bit, but almost all of them say, but it feels so right and it makes me happy. There is healing in the indigenous worldview and the, and the way it is expressed in language. I want to share in closing one more example from a wonderful um, scholar and first language uh, reviver, Gis Giselle Maria Martin, who tells us that the word for tree in her language literally means land holder, the one who holds the land. Wouldn't we live in a different world if we understood the trees to be land holders? No one would say, I'm going to go cut down all of the land holders. Language can be a way that we find our way back into kinship. In closing, I want to answer our question of what does the earth ask of us to say that the earth calls us to reciprocity, that we as human people give our gifts in return for the gifts of the earth. And to remember that we human people are not just takers from the land, that we are bearers of gifts as well the gifts of science, the gifts of art, the gifts of design and music, the gifts of our beautiful lives, our hands in the earth, our hearts open to one another. The earth calls us to reciprocity in understanding that the definition of an educated person is one who knows what their gifts are and how to give them on behalf of life. Meet you, miigwech bizindawieg. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Um, we want to open the floor to questions, both here in the room and then um, those of you who are joining us on the live stream, which I want to know, everyone in here to know there are over a thousand people on the live stream right now, um, that um, those of you on the live stream can send questions to common reading, all smushed together at uoregon.edu, and we will attempt to field those online. We have a couple of students available here in the room to um, 
uh, send around microphones to address your questions. So um, I think we'll start with questions in the room to give any folks online uh, time to um, post their questions and make sure that we receive them. So. Hello, thank you for the wonderful teachings and just being here with us today. Um, I'd like to ask you to briefly explain the difference between reciprocity and the current ecological movement of sustainability. Mm. It's a great question. Um, they certainly have much in common because for sustainability, true sustainability, we need to be able to give back. But I'm really glad that you framed it in terms of sustainability, because um, uh, uh, in, in the Western world, we think about sustainability as, as how could we live in such a way that we can continue to provide for ourselves, right, into the future. And um, I'm reminded that of an indigenous definition of sustainability is not how can we figure out how to keep taking, but how it is that we can give back, how can we be in reciprocity. And that frame shift from how can we continue to take to what is it that we have to give, to me, is the difference between sustainability and reciprocity. That being said, reciprocity is certainly all about the cyclic nature of, 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 of the fact that you can't keep taking without replenishment. Reciprocity is the notion that there's no such thing as throwing something away. It needs to re-enter the, the um, uh, cradle to cradle, as they say, um, green economy. Um, reciprocity and sustainability are very closely related, but I do think that philosophically one is more about taking and another about giving. hear your thoughts on prescribed burns and how we can learn from those um, with the uh, you know natural disasters that are occurring with wildland fires um, anything that you could share with that would be wonderful. oh yes 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 um, that is an example of what do what can we give back to the land right um, that indigenous fire science for example cultural burning which has been um, you know a product of traditional ecological knowledge is how we bring goodness to the land through these cycles of regeneration and, and reciprocity and you know Potawatomi, um, then our, our, our name actually means people of the fire. And um, my ancestors could have been, and maybe some of them were, jailed for setting cultural fires. Um, fires were, were, were um, uh, against the law. And of course, what we know today is that ethic of, of fire suppression that is part of the Western domination and control worldview that we're going to somehow control and suppress nature has of course led to the overstocking of stands, the heavy fuel loads that have led to catastrophic wildfire. Um, and so the reintroduction of, of cultural burning. Um, I know um, very much so in Oregon, right? In, in California, in the Fire Sticks Alliance, in, in uh, Australia, really all over the world, um, there is now an understanding that indigenous fire science and cultural burning is an act of reciprocity with the land that, um, that uh, protects from wildfire, enhances biodiversity, and when we enhance biodiversity, we enhance the well-being for, for all. I could talk all afternoon about cultural burning, so I'm glad, I'm glad that you asked. Thank you so much. People who are attending virtually. And Emily would like, like to know, what are ways that non-Indigenous people can adopt Indigenous viewpoints, such as animism, without entering appropriation? 
I, this is such an important question. And um, I've been talking about it with all the student groups that I've been meeting with so far. And so I'm really glad that it's on your mind. I think what I want to do to answer that question is to back up a little bit and say that what we're talking about when we say the indigenous worldview, like those views of land that we were just talking about, right? Um, one of my great teachers, Henry Lickers, uh, a wonderful indigenous thinker, said, you know, we really shouldn't be calling it indigenous knowledge. It is housed in indigenous communities, generated by indigenous communities, but all peoples were indigenous one time, we should call this organic knowledge. We could call, we should call it naturalized knowledge because it's land that, that's an ethic that doesn't come with a chromosome. It comes with being in right relationship to the earth, in learning from the earth. And so a, a, adoption of the indigenous worldview of reciprocity and gratitude and respect for the living world is, is a human impulse. It is the human impulse that has guided us since time immemorial, before we got off on this, 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 this pathway of, of, of pyramid human exceptionalism thinking. And what's important is that you adopt that worldview if it is the one that resonates with you in your own authentic way. You can be in reciprocity with the land, in gratitude for the land with your own practices. You don't take them from somebody else. Not only is that cultural appropriation, but they're less effective. If you're take, borrowing from somebody else, when they become really transformative is when you make them your own. And you say, how will I honor my commitments to the earth? How will I practice gratitude? How will I manage land, care for land with a sense of human compassion for other beings um, in my way? Um, but this way of being is, is a human legacy and, and we can embrace that, those, that human impulse for reciprocity without cultural appropriation by authenticity. Um, Jennifer says, I was struck by your comment that we can identify 100 corporate logos and only 10 plants. I want to change that for myself and my kids. Do you have any advice for someone getting started learning about plants? Mm. Yes, I do. <laughs> Go outside. <laughs> um, you know, it seems like a really simple answer. But, you know, if, when we're talking about how do we be better students, you have to be in the presence of the teacher. You have to be outside. Um, and one of the things that sometimes people think is they have to be outside in, in like some kind of pristine wilderness area. Well, nature's everywhere. Nature isn't just over there. It's in a sidewalk crack filled with moss. Um, it's, it's in your park. It's in your garden. It's in a flower pot. It's in the butterflies that, you know, come to your, to your, um, to your path. Um, Respect, attention for those beings and gratitude for those beings is a powerful entry point. It's also, I think, um, as I was in a cursory way suggesting to learn the names of beings. You don't have to learn the, the scientific names of them, right? But you have to observe them and get to know them well enough that you know who they are. And quite frankly, so that they know who you are. Um, it's paying attention. And with kids, especially, heck with my own students, you know, when I teach botany, I do tell them they have to learn the scientific names. But before they learn the scientific names, they need to forget about names and enter into relationship with those beings. Really look at them, smell them, touch them, see who their neighbors are, uh, taste them. Um, and in this way, you come into relationship with that being and you really know them begin to know them anyway, and then you can add a name to them if, if you want to. Um, but it's coming into relationship. Um, you get to know the plants the same way you get to know your neighbors is by spending time with them, hanging out, seeing what they like. I'm so grateful that you're 
on this path for for creating that kind of relationship with with, with young people. Uh, that's that's where it starts, but it's not too late, no matter how old you are. Are there any more questions in the room? Hi, thank you so much. Um, my name's Sorka. Um, I just wanted to ask how you managed to reconcile maybe some of the flaws within Western science um, uh, that often omit or ignore indigenous knowledge systems or other knowledge systems, um, but still manage to use science as a tool, um, yeah, as a tool towards the, the green path forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that question. And those of you, well, I guess in this audience, that's many of you who've read Braiding Sweetgrass know that that's really a theme of the book, isn't it? Of, of how to um, navigate these, these ways of knowing and how to use them together to braid sweetgrass, to take care of the earth, essentially. Here's how I do it, because you're absolutely right that not only has Western science brought us a host of good things, it's also brought incredible damage to the living world as well. Because one of the ways I think is that Western science is not coupled to inherently coupled to values and ethics. Um, we in fact prize the objectivity of Western science of saying that, that it is not influenced by values. That's part of the power of Western science, but it's also part of the problem of Western science. And in indigenous knowledge, responsibility and the knowledge are very closely coupled with one another. So the way that I navigate this is, there's so, many, so much to say about this. One of the ways that I navigate this is that I find the place where Western science and traditional knowledge are in good conversation and good company with one another is on the land because they're both human ways of trying to understand what the land is, is teaching us, albeit with very different ways of knowing. But I tend to uncouple with the tools of Western science from the Western worldview and certainly from scientism. Scientism that says that Western science is the only way to understand the world. No, I, I am happy to use the tools of Western science that help us see better, that help us slip into a, um, the, the boundary between human beings and, and other beings um, to really get to know them. I try to use some of the tools of Western science within the ethical constructs of indigenous worldview. I think of them as, 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 as tools and that we can use the tools of Western science. I shouldn't say we, I can use the tools of Western science without adopting the Western worldview. And, um, and that's, that's how I, I tend to navigate that. Is to, is to uncouple them so that I allow values and ethics to guide the use of those tools. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I want to say thank you now to everyone for, for being here. And I can hardly believe our time is <laughs> at a close. And I wish we had time for every single question that I know is in the room and has come through the live stream. Um, Robin, uh, thank you for the gift of your, your knowledge and your time. And um, I, I was thinking about uh, Joy Harjo, our National Poet Laureate. And, um, uh, you know, she has this poem about singing. And uh, part of it says, the earth is leaning sideways and a song is emerging from the floods and fires, urgent tendrils of life toward the sun. You must be friends with silence to hear the songs of the guardians of silence are the most powerful. They are the most rare. And so I wanted to say thank you, especially to Robin for urging tendrils of life toward the sun through your songs, your teachings and your guardianship. So, thank you. Miigwech. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>